This is a Geek Leader Podcast, and I'm your host, John Rauta. This show is all about helping us grow as leaders, become better technologists, and improve our lives both at work and at home. I hope you enjoy the show and learn a lot. Hello, world. Welcome to episode 201 of Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauta, and today's sponsor is Private Internet Access. If you've ever surfed the web and wanted to do it securely, especially when you're traveling or uh, using someone else's uh, network, you definitely need Private Internet Access. Private Internet Access allows you to have a secure VPN without them logging what data you're, what you're doing, what transactions you're making, or anything like that to connect to anywhere in the world. You can also change your default location so it appears as if you're coming from a different place. Why is this helpful, you say? If you're not doing anything nefarious, well, it's really helpful if you want to test DNS resolution from different places and different time zones. Um, It's a really cool tool and it's not very expensive at all. You can get plans starting at $3.99 a month and you can find out more by going to ageekleader.com slash VPN. Again, that's ageekleader.com slash VPN. All right, Geek Leaders, today on the show, I've got Eric Shepard, and he's an accomplished leader who stepped away from a CEO role at a SaaS company uh, to help focus on talent assessments. He's also the chair of the IEEE work group, uh, developing and recommending practices for defining competencies. Um, one of the cool things that I really want to talk about with Eric today is going to be about HR technology, uh, helping people when it comes to digital transformation and talent transformations and, and, and things to that effect. Um, with all that being said, Eric, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks, John. Great to be here. And if you don't mind, just tell the audience a little bit about how you got to where you are today, um, just to lay some context for our conversation. Sure. Well, I think I got here today by making a lot of mistakes along the way. <laughs> <laughs> so you might be able to tell uh, from my accent, I'm originally from uh, London, England. Uh, I came here, uh, I was kind of transferred here to take over a company. Oh, I, I should go pre that because it kind of sounds. Uh, uh, so pre that I was going to be uh, in the Merchant Navy and I studied about radar and electronics and uh, understood how things worked at a molecular level in in transistors and blah, 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 stumbled into the computer industry. Uh, In that computer industry, I had uh, some great mentors who taught me um, the the, uh, the lay of the land and and ended up repairing computers, working alongside software engineers, then working alongside sales engineers and salespeople, um, and worked for a British entrepreneur called uh, Sinclair, who produced uh, a machine here in the States that was distributed uh, as the Timex 1000. Um, then stumbled into another company that was uh, uh, in the early stages of email uh, and running it as a background task for machines. They transferred me to the US, which is where I was about to start, and uh, had an interesting uh, time because I just led a small team of sales and sales support uh, engineers um, to support our customers, which were uh, high-tech customers deploying our software products. Um, Out of that, I then started my own business to represent software products. At the time, it was DOS, Windows, and Macintosh, uh, uh, representing foreign corporations' software products here in the United States. So I ended up learning a lot about um, startups, Uh, being how do you compete with the incumbent player? How do you persuade software developers to put features in that they don't see are valid in their home market, but are required in a different market Mm -hmm. um, to kind of negotiate through uh, and using kind of user stories and language that you can both communicate with. Progressed on to another company. uh, So I was representing companies, uh, represented a company called Question Mark that did testing and assessment software. So that software is used by a number of uh, high-tech companies to underpin their certification programs, one of them being SAP. Um, And so learned a lot about assessing knowledge and skills. And within the company, learned a lot about how do we get different disparaged teams working together. We built the company from just a, a few people to 150 people and worldwide. So we had to kind of bring these cultures together um, so that people work well together to produce great um, software. And then of course we went through the moving installable software to software as a service and cloud services, which uh, is another headache. 
But I, I tell you, the, <laughs> the biggest le lesson I learned, it's all about the people uh, and understanding the people and finding ways to communicate. Uh, uh, but that probably we'll get into a little deeper later. So it sounds like you went through a lot of digital transformation, which is kind of one of those buzzwords we talk a lot about on the show. Um, and but you, you mentioned it's all about the people. Um, can you elaborate a little bit about how, um, or, or maybe a story sometime where you were going through one of those changes, whether it's being from you know installable software to cloud-based and or, or any of the others where the people really mattered and made a big difference? Yeah, so I think when um, when you're doing installable software, there's a temptation just to take that, install it on an instant by instant in the cloud. Uh, and then you go, hey, we've got cloud-based software, but it's really multiple instances. And then maintenance becomes a nightmare. You have DevOps um, uh, uh, being very upset. Developers uh, will uh, struggle to take the old code base to the new code base. Um, so that you can run a multi-tenanted system. Um, and then when you get it to customers, uh, they used to be nervous, less nervous these days, but they used to be nervous that data would be commingled. And a lot of that was initially to, to help us all through that on a journey together. It was about defining our mission, our vision, our purpose, what we were trying to do, why we were trying to do it, um, and it, probably the why is, is, is most important. Uh, so we knew that uh, it was, go, as we grew, we knew it would be untenable to have multiple installations unless we just kept uh, exponentially growing our DevOps team. Um, and so uh, facilitating conversations between the various groups so that we all had a shared understanding about what our mission was, uh, it was to grow an, uh, a company with great products and an enjoyable um, environment. So what was our vision? We we're gonna provide great software for our customers, um, our purpose, our, our values. You know, we valued respect, but we also valued candor. And so in facilitating discussions, um, when people would either start to violate the values or would be misaligned with the vision or purpose, to gently bring them back, maybe not singling them out because that doesn't work too well, um, but say, well, let's take a time out and let's just consider, you know, why we're all doing this. Um, so, that, so that's part of it. And then the other part is um, like the first rule of negotiation, understand the people. So everyone's a, a complex human being. They've all come from different backgrounds. Uh, they have different values, although they might be aligned on the company values, but some uh, might be more aligned uh, with their family. Some might be more aligned with uh, the technology and having the right architecture and uh, et cetera. So it's getting to know each individual is really, really helpful. The larger the group gets, the more difficult that is. Um, as an illustration uh, of, of this, we um, had a big problem between our um, uh, uh, product uh, people, generally developers, and our salespeople. So the uh, develop cl classical thing on the development side of the house, they'd say the salespeople are selling all the wrong stuff and they don't know what they're doing. And the salespeople would say, oh, these development team, you know, they're giving me products I can't sell. And, and um, so we, we ran an assessment um, and uh, it was an assessment, I think it was by colors, um, but it was one of these where you kind of take introversion, extroversion on one scale, and you take thinking and feeling on another scale. And we drew a big circle on the ground and we had people take the assessment and then they had to go and stand in the quadrant that their personality assessment uh, would indicate that they were aligned to. And it was so obvious that people were just laughing at the obviousness of this all in that our uh, developers were all over, tended to be more uh, introverts and, and thinking. And our uh, salespeople tended to be extroverts and uh, a balance between thinking and feeling. But when they kind of got that we're all good people and we're all trying to do the right thing, but we have different communication styles, we have different ways of expressing ourselves. And that was then the basis of a, a change on the way we communicated between um, customers' requirements and 
what we needed to develop, how do we organize the priorities? Um, does it make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you kind of see that trend a lot of times when you're talking um, developers versus sales, you know, what we're an introvert versus extrovert and, and running into that and how there is a difference. I know we've, we've been working on some projects um, aligning different groups together. We, we kind of see a very similar between, you know, the folks that are actually doing the creating versus uh, the ones making the, um, um, the, the more product type decisions of, of where things are going to go and what the strategic thinking is. And uh, it's, it's been interesting to kind of see how, um, how that works together and how, how you can facilitate that communication a little bit better. Um, because we, we, we do struggle a lot of times in technology with the communication portion. Right. And, and, and the thing is, uh, you know, I mentioned before, I was in uh, the testing business. So we would test for knowledge, skills, and abilities. And you t- basically, you'd be right or wrong. You pass the test, you pass the exam, or you're done. So you can think of the, uh, you know, Microsoft's uh, certification exams or the Oracle or Google certification. You either get it or you don't. With personality, it's kind of different. You're more on a scale mm-hmm. and nothing's right and nothing's wrong. It's just the way you are. And now if you can recognize the way you are and recognize that other people are different and there is no right or wrong, and we're all kind of positioned on a scale, it then makes it easier to understand other people. It's easier to empathize with their challenges because it's not only the task and the job that might be the challenge. It's also maybe that it doesn't naturally play to their strengths. So ideally, people will recognize their personality and gravitate to the jobs and tasks that naturally appeal to their personality traits, values, and preferences. So one of the things you, you briefly mentioned there is empathy. And um, that is one of the things that I've, I've had to really learn to, to work on is my empathy and empathy with yeah. others. And uh, <laughs> do you have any advice or tips or tricks from, let's say, a new leader or even a seasoned leader that realizes that, you know, sometimes I don't see things from other people's perspectives very well. Sometimes I don't have empathy for someone else's uh, difficult times or what they're going through. Uh, do you have any tips or tricks for people like us that may need some some assistance with empathy? So I'm grinning from ear to ear because it's not easy. Uh, I think there's uh, the, 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 the part of it comes down to really listening and really understanding and providing the other person an environment that's psychologically safe, that they can open up about their, tri- their true fears. So many of us would have a veneer to, um, to, so we don't expose our true fears and our true concerns. Um, so uh, just an example of this, when there was the uh, migration to work from home uh, with COVID, people were extremely fearful. You know, am I gonna lose my job? Am I gonna be able to work from home? Am I gonna be able to look after my kids while I still develop software, whatever it is. And um, what leaders would uh, and managers um, that were more successful would take time to, um, even though it was a virtual conversation, they would take time to listen and understand and potentially ch- change something that would be meaningful for the person. So but you got to look after your kids from, from nine till one while they do virtual classes. Could you come in kind of earlier and then we'll give you time off? Mm-hmm. But, but I mean, I'm just, I'm leaping to a solution there. But it is the really listening and and confirming that you really understand what's going on and giving someone the space to say it. So often we're we're task oriented. You know, you do this, I'll do this. Daily stand up. We we'll get this done. We we'll get that done. Um, now there is a, a an issue with empathy is some people might try and take advantage of it. Yeah. But it, as long as you've got um, open communications and you can say look, I, I understand that you're working from home and you've got your kids. Um, we still have to get our work done. How are we going to manage that together? So it, whilst being sympathetic and empathetic, um, they're still being paid to do a job. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's a balance, but understanding people, providing psychological safety. Okay, so, so let's... let's... Skip ahead to kind of what you're talking about there, because I've seen it uh, many times, actually, where a leader is, uh, I don't want to say over empathetic, but but basically they get they get walked on, you know, like a doormat because they um, empathize too much and people will totally take advantage of that. Um, what are some things we can do to to maybe 
and know where that boundaries are, where those lines are of, of where we're, um, you know, we empathize, but we still understand someone's got a job to do. So w- one thing I would do there is, is um, quantify goals with numbers. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's good. Uh, so then you can be talking about the numbers rather than someone's performance on a task. Um, and then you can say, well, but we still have to make this deliverable. How are we going to do that given the, the challenges you have? But, but ha- so now the number is the bad guy, not the manager. Right. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and really, it, I think it's authentic conversations. There was a great book um, called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. If you haven't read it or if your listeners haven't read it, I'd certainly recommend it. The, the, uh, the key, the, there's five levels um, that are described within the book and I'll attempt to describe them, but one is trust. Mm-hmm. Um, are you gonna embarrass me in public? Because if you're gonna be embarrass me in public, I'm probably not gonna speak up. Uh, or are you gonna use anything I say against me? Then I'm probably not gonna speak up. So the first is, is developing trust, which is around psychological safety and understanding. The second level is uh, authentic communications. So uh, am I able to tell you uh, what, what's really wrong or really right? And are you able to listen to what's really wrong and really right? Um, so that is enabled by trust, but there's a, how do we tease out the real impactful things? Um, ab- above that is, is a commitment. So if you have an authentic conversation, um, y- it should be possible for everybody to commit because they all, they've all they all been heard. We recognize that there is no perfect solution, but this is the solution we're gonna go for given all of the evidence, given our resources, given our capacity, this is what we're gonna go for, is everybody committed? Um, now, if, if you have been able to have that authentic conversation and sometimes they're difficult and sometimes they're ugly, um, but so are we as people. Sometimes <laughs> it's up to the, the facilitator, the manager, the leader to ensure that it's it's uh, not destructive. You know, it's got to be constructive moving to a point. But getting that commitment, when, when you've got commitments, now you can hold people accountable. But as we know that holding people accountable with a big stick doesn't work very well. Right. Um, it, it's a matter of keeping uh, on top of things like daily calls, stand-ups, et cetera, so that you're, um, you're, you're saying, well, we've we got to get this done by the end of the week and it's Tuesday and we, we, it, we don't have a path to success. How are we going to get there? Um, so there's those authentic conversations happening at an operational level. Um, and that people are held accountable, not um, not destroyed in public or beaten up with a rod, but just uh, there's a clear accountability. And then um, the, the other thing about holding people accountable, often people will push back, mm-hmm. but they've, they've heard the message. And sometimes when people hear the pushback, they go, oh, this person's not understanding what I'm saying. So they reinforce it and they push it. But unfortunately, that then can antagonize the other party. So um, a simple phrase like, I think you understand what I'm saying. So let's move on to the next thing. The person will hear it, digest it, but not be embarrassed to feel like they, um, they've they got to fight back until they win because there's going to be a no win there. And then at the end of the day with these five levels in, in this book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, the top is uh, uh, is getting results. So at the end of the day, stuff goes wrong. Murphy's law kicks in all the time. Uh, there's always some challenge. Um, but, you know, if you've unified the team behind, these are the results we want to get. That that helps focus and direction. Absolutely. And, you know, you've definitely seen some of that. I've seen some of that myself. And one of the things that I've just discover holding people accountable is, is much harder said or much harder done than said. You know, it's, it's easy to say, yeah, let's hold people accountable. But you know, going back to what you said earlier about the metrics and making sure you have numbers, um, I think that's a really important part because if you don't have those numbers and those metrics to measure um, what, what the outcome is that you're trying to and have people committed to those, you can't truly go back and assess what they've done. You know, um, I don't think it was Peter Drucker that said, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. And, and the same thing is true, I guess, when it comes to holding accountable, because somebody always has an argument or an excuse or a reason. But when you, at the end of the day, if you have those numbers in place and you have someone committed to, you know, achieving a certain number by a certain date, then you can 
go back and hold them accountable much easier than than just you know do a good job. Yeah, I thousand percent agree. You expressed it very well. Uh, the thing I would add there, John, is that they they need to have bought into the number. Yeah. So if they if you just announce a number or they think it's the wrong number, uh, the reasons and the excuses and the torturous conversations will just happen later. It's better to bring the torturous conversations forward and find out the number that everyone will agree to um, and and be willing to be held accountable um, for. And and it's a that's a torturous conversation. It just happens earlier on in the process and it's healthier for the process. So so when you do that early on, do you have the other person create those numbers? Like um, you, your um, employees create the, the numbers I think that the they're going to hold? the key thing is to define the problem you're trying to solve mm-hmm. and say, if we solve that, what would how would the number change? So, um, for instance, uh, if if we deliver this module, customer satisfaction would go from five to six, um, or you know. So that's the problem we're trying to solve. Okay, now how are we going to solve that problem? Okay, we're going to deliver a module. Um, okay, well then, what's the delivery date? What's the time? What's the feature set? What's the scope? What's the the minimum viable product that will achieve that customer satisfaction that we're looking for. Uh, so it, it's it's getting, you know, if you know the problem you're solving and then you know the, the deliverables that you're delivering, uh, you, you can kind of work with people. Just saying you come up with a number, um, it, it will be ill-defined. And, um, and, and in my experience, uh, at the end of the day, they achieve the number, but you don't improve customer satisfaction. Yeah, you don't get that actual result. Delivered. You know, <laughs> it's like we did it on time. I'm sorry, you know, they didn't work, but no one told me that you needed to have it mm. working by that date. You know, I mean, just silly. You know, you, you get. Yeah, yeah, I think we're all in tech here, so we all get how this works. <laughs> yep, exactly, exactly. So, um, you, you wrote a book about transforming talent we talk a lot about digital transformations what's the difference here between um, talent transformation versus like a digital transformation that that a company might get through well a a digital transformation um uh, it's kind of almost difficult to describe because you're an Mm -hmm. expert on this but uh (laughs) it's using technology to change business practices um the component that's often missed by that is that the changes are going to impact people so if we deploy um, AI in a call center, uh, that the more chatbots in a call center, for instance, that's going to uh, change the requirements of the people that we have in the call center. So we went through a digital transformation. Now what happened to the people? So what the book is trying to do is one recognize change. So there's there's exponential change coming because there's a such amazing technology coming. So robotics, augmentation, uh, uh, and AI, uh, ML, all those good things. So we're gonna see exponential change, we all get that. And how are people gonna, um, how are are people gonna deal with this change? And so as managers, how do we help people manage the change? So we we talk, uh, for instance, about force field analysis. What's the uh, forces that are pushing us forward and what's the forces that are holding us back? And how can we, uh, you know, increase one and and, and reduce another? A great example of this is um, COVID nineteen, in that a lot of people were resistant to deploy technologies like Microsoft Teams, uh, or Zoom. You know, they said, "Well, I'd rather have a phone call, or I'd rather just come and visit you in the office." Then we didn't have a choice, and all of a sudden, the forces against uh, the change collapsed. And very quickly things got deployed. So as an example, there was a pharmaceutical company I was working with. Um, they were um, they were deploying uh, uh, Microsoft Teams to about twenty thousand people, just over twenty thousand people, and they had an eighteen month rollout plan. They rolled it out in two weeks <laughs> <laughs> um, because all of a sudden people went, "Wait a minute, I need a tool like Teams," you know. And so uh, I'm sure they cut corners, and but they just made it happen. So when you've got a burning platform, uh, it's easier to transform technology, um, but you also need to make sure your your teams are uh, are being upskilled and trained and uh, and and buying into the process. In, in many cases, we didn't have time in luxuries for some of this training, but you know these technologies were simple enough that we could just use. 
So talent transformation is trying to recognize that uh, technology is changing. Uh, we need to be agile to change. Um, what, what can we change and what can't we change? What can we learn and what's inherent to us? So if we think about our, our personality traits and, and values, they're kind of static. Unless we get a life-changing event, they're kind of static. We are as extrovert as we are and we are as open as we are. It's just the way we are. However, we can lay on top of that, we can learn a, a new skills like social intelligence and emotional intelligence, uh, where we can learn how we think and understand that other people think differently or the same and how we communicate. So learning about those things helps us um, work more effectively with other people. And then uh, for, for managers to understand psychological safety, what does it take to be psychologically safe? And what is the kind of safety that we should provide um, to get the behaviors we want? As an example for that, John, if uh, let's think about communication skills. So communications amongst the development team uh, will be one way, you know, it's either on um, a virtual platform, it's conversations, it's showing diagrams. Communications on an oil platform are completely different. The priority on an oil platform is someone's physical safety. If I shout at them and call them rude names, that is appropriate because I'm caring about their physical well-being. But if I'm in a development meeting and I start calling them names and shouting at them, it will put everybody into a fight and flight mode and the meeting will, will end with no effective results. So it depends on the situation. It depends on the behaviors that you're trying to cultivate how the manager should facilitate meetings. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think that's one of the, one of the things that sometimes we, we get confused of when is the appropriate time for things like that. And, you know, um, like I see some people communicate a certain way on Microsoft teams, like we were talking about, but then they carry that communication into the real world and or, or vice versa. And it's a little bit different, you know, because with Microsoft teams, we have, words, right? We have what we're typing, but in, in real life, we'll have uh, vocal tonality. We'll have the expressions they have on their face and things like that. And, and that will adjust the way you say certain things, you know? Um, and I have to try to remind people that, you know, when you read something, you need to read it. Um, you're reading it in the tone that you're in right now. So if you come back from a meeting and it was a rough meeting and it was, you know, you had a bad day or maybe the kids were screaming and you're just like, oh, I'm so frustrated. <laughs> and you sit down and you pull yeah. up your message and you see a message where someone's telling you kind of a a snarky little joke or whatever they're, they're giving you a little jab but it's kind of a it's all in fun you're going to read it like man everybody's coming down on me today you know and and that may not be the case that's so, so true it, yeah. as a leader we have to understand when is the appropriate time <laughs> you know that's right yeah that's all right yeah i'm reading a book uh, right now john it's called uh oh i think it's called humor seriously Hmm. And it's, it's this idea, it's, um, it's based on research, it's done by uh, um, some very smart people, I think out of Stanford, a couple of people, Stanford University, and it talks about how humor can disarm a situation and can be, and, and one thing I learned about it is that um, I would think about humor as being jokes, you know, oh, let me tell you a joke. Um, but it isn't uh, that way in business, uh, but there's ways of diffusing situations, um, infusing, you know, making fun of yourself or making fun of the situation. Um, that, that, so I, I'm, I'm going to learn to be funny. <laughs> I'll give you a little tip of one thing that I do to try to be funny and lighten the mood in Microsoft Teams is I use those little gifts. <laughs> Oh, There's right, no right, right, yeah, but yeah, I probably yeah. overuse them for my team and I'll try to like find <laughs> something that's just, just a little bit humorous and send that. And, you know, you kind of like, cause I'll, I'll type something and I'll be like, Ooh, maybe that came off a little harsh. Let me make sure I put a little gif in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think these are the new skills that we're learning as well. So if, you know, if we went into um, a physical office to meet, you know, people might bring like donuts or coffee, or they might bring a cuddly toy or they might bring something to levitate the uh, the atmosphere, you know, like give everybody a Rubik's cube, or uh, not with the expectation they're going to solve it, but it just kind of changes your thinking. With Teams, other virtual platforms, how do you bring that creativity? And and I think that's what we're hopefully going to see in the in the months and years to come. Is there's ways for us to demonstrate our humanity through these platforms? Yeah, I think so. I think it's. Uh... 
you, you know, it's, it's a, it's been an interesting shift, especially I hired, hired someone that um, um, they, they literally started one day and then the next day we locked down. <laughs> you know? right, right. So it's like, Oh, well now I don't even get to work. You know, now all, all, all I know of you is remote. <laughs> so it's kind of, um, you know, how do, how do you get to that? And, you know, turning the camera on and having those face-to-face conversations is, is one way of doing that for sure. Um, but also just like you said, humor and, and little things that you type or that you do and, and you know, trying to stay like hard. I think it's one of the things that COVID has shown me is that I don't have to be so serious all the time, you know? Right. Yes. I agree. Yeah. For me too. Yeah. Yeah. I used to be like, well, when you're at work, you put your work hat on, when you're at home, you put your home hat on. Well, mm-hmm. what happens when you're working, when you're at home, you know, then what do you do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and to understand that, you know, it's not everything we had planned for 2020, it, it was out the window right, right away. And that's okay. As long as we, can you know focus on what is the minimal viable products that we have to deliver and let's deliver those and do it to the best of our ability and and see where that takes us yep yep i, I think another aspect of that is appreciation mm-hmm. so that there's the the levity the humor the but but appreciation it's like hey 2020 screwed us up um, but we're still here and we're still working to deliver stuff and it's harder, but, you know, appreciate your effort, both at an individual level and because uh, we were hold, uh, talking about holding people accountable. But there's also that how do we appreciate people in a physical environment? We could bring donuts, as a, for instance, or bring have a pizza lunch Friday. Or the, how do we do that now with these virtual systems? It's not quite as easy. It's definitely not. And I've seen some, some good stuff that some people do, you know, I've seen some leaders that, um, you know, they'll do uh, still, still maintain team lunches, like, cause they used to have team lunch like every other week or something. And they still do that virtually. And then they have like little contests to see who can have, you know, the, the most unique meal or something like that. And um, I've seen people use steam games to do online gaming, you know, together. Um, another cool idea was the virtual um, escape room. So there's a lot of virtual escape rooms that you can kind of play together on your computer. And I've seen teams do that, um, which is, which is again, another really neat way to, uh, to work together and, and show that appreciation. I'm terrible at those escape rooms. I'd still be in there. <laughs> uh, well, I, I am uh I'm addicted to escape rooms, both in real life and in VR. <laughs> I live in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I, we, were, we had some uh, some family in town, and we were looking at doing an escape room. We went through them, and of all the places that were open, um, there was only one room out of all those places that we hadn't done. So we've done every other room at the place. We show up with the family, and they're like, oh, I remember I hosted a, this game with you and this game, I think. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we've done them all. This is the only – this is the last one left. <laughs> So when you've done the game and you've mastered it, you, you basically you burnt out. There's no point doing the game again. I guess. Right. Yeah. You don't, you don't do it again. Um, mm-hmm. And the same thing, like that's one thing I've noticed. So I've got an Oculus um, uh, quest and I, I'll download some games and play the escape room games. But once you beat them, you're, you're done. Like you, it's not like Mario where you can just play it again for fun. See if you can do faster. It's kind of like, well, I'm done. <laughs> I'm not going to do this yeah. again. Yeah. And is there is there a Twitch equivalent for those um, those kind of virtual uh, 3D games where people can watch you play? Uh, yeah, you could because uh, with, with the Oculus, like I always, t- I, I I've um, I, I'll tether them now to uh, the PC, yep. and you know I'll download certain ones off Steam and other ones off of um, uh, the Oculus Quest Store or Rift Store mm-hmm. and play them. But yeah, they stream to the computer, so I definitely could stream them. Um, I haven't or don't uh, probably because I'll be embarrassed on how bad I do. <laughs> But, but that seems to me the next level. It's a bit like professional sports. You know, mm-hmm. we go and watch professional sports. And I, I, I'm not a gamer, uh, and, and so I, I kind of don't get it. But I get other people get it. And so they love gaming. And then there's this uh, new world of watching people uh, perform in these, uh, in these games. So even if you know the solution, people are going to watch you perform. Yeah, it's so my kid... He will spend in e- probably an equal, if not more, amount of time watching someone play the game on YouTube than he will actually play the games that he has. Um, right. Yeah. And it, it blows my mind. He'll be sitting there on his iPad watching. I was like, why aren't you just playing Minecraft? Why are you watching Minecraft? <laughs> you know? Yeah. He's like, well, I think it's cool what this guy can do. I was like, well, why don't you try to do that? He's like, well, I will eventually. <laughs> I think the, the, in a, it's the comparison to the physical world. It's like, well, why aren't you playing hockey or yeah or you know um, soccer or football or something it's like well i but i sometimes i want to watch it because i might learn it and get excited by it yeah Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I definitely see that. And I think you're absolutely right. It is, it is pretty equivalent. And it just shows you how people change or, or how, how technology is changing the way people interact in, in different ways. Yeah, yeah. Um, so how can people uh, find out more about the things that you're working on, connect with you, and, and maybe pick up a copy of this book? Uh, well, you can pick up a copy of the book from uh, Amazon and uh, Talent Transformation, uh, Develop Something for the New World of Work. Uh, so I can't remember the full title, but you'll see it, Eric <laughs> Shepard. And, um, and so the, the book kind of uh, explains how technology is changing, which I think most of your audience will understand, already understand, understand about change itself and agility. Uh, and then we represent this talent transformation pyramid, which helps people understand uh, the difference between mindset and skill set and what supports uh, behaviors and what supports capabilities on the job. And then how does that kind of roll up into uh, business outcomes? And then there's a section on the history of assessment, uh, just out of interest, and then assessing individuals, assessing teams, assessing organizations. And I think one, one thing I'd like people to get out of the book is that assessments are very powerful, but they're just like tools in that you've got to use the right tool in the right place. Um, so there was a recently an HBO uh, documentary or special uh, about the Myers-Briggs uh, test. And uh, it seemed to be discussing things that were uh, where the tool was used inappropriately. So Myers-Briggs is a way of kind of developing a better understanding of, of people's style. It's not used for recruitment. There's other kinds of tests to test um, uh, situational judgment or test mathematical skills. They might be used for recruitment. So the book kind of helps reveal what kind of uh, assessment is helpful to develop teams or to develop organizations. So that's the book. Um, one thing that came out of the book was this uh, strategic importance of competencies. So competencies, you can have behavioral competencies or capabilities, functional competencies. So I chair the IEEE group. So IEEE is a standards group, just defining the electrical standards that we use in our house and defines Wi-Fi standards. Uh, so we're defining a data model and uh, best practices for defining competencies. And, and the goal there, John, is that we could make the world kind of a fairer place and a more understandable place. So if we could take um, school, colleges, universities, take their courses and their degrees and say, these are the competencies that are taught, Mm -hmm. And let's take credentials, and these are the competencies that are recognized. And these, uh, in the job, these are the competencies that we need. Someone who's doing career planning can kind of do a gap analysis and say, well, that's the occupation I want, but I seem to be missing these competencies. Let me go off to Coursera or Udacity or, or a local college or university to, uh, to obtain those uh, competencies being recognized by degree or credential. So it's, uh, I, I often think of it as what we're doing is developing the satellites for GPS. So just as satellites are used for GPS, uh, we're putting up the data models for, uh, for badges, for credentials, for occupations, uh, for credentials, for I said that, competencies. So we'll, we should be able to enable a new set of apps that can help people look at this data, understand where they are, and navigate to where they, uh, where they want to go to. Oh, very good. Uh, well, Eric, man, I really enjoyed talking to you. Uh, I, think, uh, I think you're doing good work and keep it up. Thanks, John. It was great uh, talking to you. <laughs> All right. Have a good one. If you enjoyed that episode please uh, leave a rating and review in apple Podcasts. i'd greatly appreciate that and also don't forget to check out merch we have some t-shirts that uh, i've designed that are on at geekleader.com um, you can click on the merchandise uh, section there and check that out and also don't forget about the books from our guests so if you like this guest and other guests that have written books please um, go ahead and check that out at geekleader.com i would greatly appreciate it and i'm sure they would too